Hello and welcome to the Book Lounge. Today we are talking about A Brief History of Time by Stephen Hawking. Your hosts are myself, Corinne Ritchie. And me, Tom Butler Bowden. Each week, our main event are the Book Insight episodes, which give you in-depth explorations of the best nonfiction books. But here in the Book Lounge, it's more of an informal chat on the Book of the Week. Yeah, and uh, as curator, I'll give my take on each book and what my highlights are, why I think it's still relevant. Um, the basic idea is that we choose books which can advance your work or your life or just expand your mind. That's right, and I will weigh in on the book. I'll update you on the latest news about the author and the title. Yeah, so um, Stephen Hawking. Uh, I went back and sort of looked uh, a bit closer at his life, tried to familiar ourselves with the facts. Um, he was diagnosed with motor neurone disease in 1963 and given only two years to live. But of course, this, he got the speech generating device which transformed things for him. Um, he was a professor at Cambridge University, uh, the same post Isaac Newton held. And he died in March 2018 on the date of Einstein's birthday. Um, so he, he in, the, in the end, lived with motor neuron for more than 50 years. Um, and one interesting fact, he was buried at London's Westminster Abbey next to the remains of Isaac Newton and Charles Darwin. Um, and in 2018, when his personal effects were auctioned off, someone paid $88,000 for a copy of The Brief History of Time that was signed by Hawking in the form of a thumbprint. Um, and his PhD thesis, someone bought for $750,000. Um, Unbelievable. It's yeah. Amazing. And um, one other thing I uncovered, a, a Christie spokesman at the auction said that the lots represented the ultimate triumph of scientific brilliance over adversity. Um, did you follow this um, this auction yourself, Corinne? I thought it was quite interesting. Yeah, that's right. I found that um, his wheelchair sold for nearly four hundred thousand um, dollars after his after he died, and that was for his very first wheelchair. So this is quite quite an old one, and um, yeah, people just are clamoring for all of these artifacts that are sold alongside our items from Charles Darwin and um, Albert Einstein. And uh, yeah, Christie's is very selective. And uh, it's really interesting to see people spending small fortunes on these, um, these relics of our, the greatest minds of our time. It's pretty mm. interesting. Yeah, it is. And, and, and the parallels with, you know, the, this, the standing on the shoulders of giants that came before him, etc. Um, I think it tells us a lot about the Hawking phenomenon, sort of where you draw the line between his work, you know, as a researcher, as a writer, popularizer of science, and uh, the man himself. It's all sort of rolled up together. And um, I, I just wonder if he, if he would have had the same impact, um, you know, if he'd just been a healthy, regular guy and, you know, looking like any other any other person, but there was, there was something about um, his personal story which amplified his message and made him seem more intriguing to people. It's true. I know. It's sadly, it feels like when you have something like ALS, and especially in his condition where he could literally only control the movement of his eyes, which allowed him to communicate and to use his wheelchair and all these things, like you'd sort of think that somebody in that state could just survive and that would be miraculous enough but he wasn't just surviving he was writing books and giving lectures and appearing on the big bang theory on abc and like all these you know things it's just it's incredible it really is yeah and and carrying on um relationships and affairs and <laughs> yeah <laughs> um yeah all, all of that sort of thing very interesting that's right well and hawking himself had said that he wondered sort of if his body had worked differently, whether he would have had the time to 
ponder the universe as deeply as he did and to do the work right. that he did and to have a life goal of a unifying theory of the entire universe. He thought, well, you know, if my body had worked differently, perhaps I'd be running around doing other stuff and my mind couldn't be, you know, as free to um, be occupied about these black holes and space-time continuum. Sure, yeah. I mean, as any academic would know, most of your time's taken up with bureaucracy and marking papers and chatting to students. And um, I guess a lot of that was sort of um, absolved from him and, and his tasks, which, which must make a huge difference. That's right. Um, but shall we have a, have a quick delve into some of the ideas in the book? I mean, the, the thing that made him famous as a researcher was his work on the Big Bang, that he sort of proved that it happened and how it happened and when it happened. Um, but for me, one of, the, one of the fascinating things that he talks about is the constants in the universe, like the charge of the electron, the ratio of the masses, the proton to the electron. It all seems to have been very precisely tuned to ignite sparks of life in the, co in the cosmos. Um, it, this is a quote from him. The remarkable fact is that the values of these numbers seem to have been very finely adjusted to make possible the development of life, um, which is you know pretty amazing when you when you sort of gaze out into a apparent dead looking universe that somehow things can come together to create the miracle of uh, of, of conscious awareness. Absolutely, yeah. Mm. Um, and he. Uh, this this gets more interesting because um, if you look at the way that the universe came together um, in, in the exact way that it did, that it could easily be interpreted as evidence that the universe had been designed. Um, and uh, the book gets very interesting when he talks about how um, the Big Bang, the Catholic Church, unexpectedly declared it to be in accordance with the Bible, you know, after centuries of sort of being anti-science, um, that God might have used this amazing technique to spark the creation of the cosmos. That's right. That was one of the things I found most interesting in this book was that he walks through the history of uh, astronomy and sort of the study of space, starting with Aristotle and Ptolemy and through to Galileo and Newton and eventually Einstein. And throughout that history that he sort of walks through, he talks about that clash between science and religion, where at certain points they were in conflict with one another when the church thought that Earth was the center of the universe. And to say any different was blasphemy and a slap to the face of God, essentially. Yeah. Uh, so it was a big problem. Yeah. Um, but now it feels like perhaps the church is trying to make up for its uh, past sins, if you will, and <laughs> um, is trying to actually adopt these scientific theories rather than punish people for believing in them. And so I thought that was really interesting to see how uh, science and religion can play nicely together because um, for this, at least in this case, when it comes to the Big Bang, they don't see how it couldn't have been you know, a, a creator that sort of started this, this, um, this Big Bang. And, yeah. you know, so both, both theories could possibly be true. And it's, mm. it's especially interesting that Stephen Hawking doesn't outright um, say that he doesn't think that that's possible. If anything, yeah. he says, we don't play by chance. We know the odds of something like this happening. And had the uh, Big Bang occurred even the minutest fraction of a second earlier or later, life as we know it could not have been possible. So mm -hmm. with those tiny, tiny odds, it just does not seem like it was luck or chance. It feels like it happened specifically in order to create what we see today. Yeah, I, th I quite like this about um, Hawking is that um, he's not he's not in that same vein as um, the Richard Dawkins kind of scientist, the right. very sort of uh, fundamentalist atheist. I mean, I don't think I don't think um, Hawking was, you know, particularly a believer or anything or religious or but I mean, the fact that he sort of kept an open mind on these things um, was pretty interesting coming from from a person of his standing, I think. 
It's true. There's a humility about Stephen Hawking that's just really remarkable, considering, again, he's one of the greatest minds of our time who has studied more about these things than, than most, and yet he still has this humility to say, this is what we know, but there's still so much more we don't know, and so I'm not going to say that something is impossible when we just don't know. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah, I mean, I, I guess that's also why he was a great science writer, um, is that he can, you know, he, he's not too dry. Um, he can sort of convey the wonder of the universe very well, more than most uh, scientists. Um, Agreed, yeah. yeah. He, he worked really hard on Brief History of Time to make it so that it felt more relatable than what most scientists write. He had this um, motto that for every equation he included in Brief History of Time, the readership would be cut in half. So for that reason, he only included one equation in the entire book, which was E equals MC squared. Apart from that, it's equation free so that hopefully everyone can engage. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, the, the, the famous thing that uh, you always hear about Brief History of Time is that the sort of ratio of people that actually read it to the end was pretty small compared to the number of copies bought. Um, That's so, true. you know, he, he, he did his extreme best. But at the end of the day, I mean, he's talking about incredibly complex mathematical equations for how the universe works. And um, there's a point beyond which you don't want to dumb things down anymore. Um, and I think he sort of got to that point. And it's a sort of book that everyone wanted to have on their coffee table at home um, to show that they were at least interested in thinking about this stuff, um, <laughs> even if at the end of the day, most people never actually read it through. That's right. Pay no attention to the coffee rings on the cover. We, we really like this book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, one other thing that I think there are many things in this book about um, the sort of wormholes in the universe and stuff like that. But the thing that, um, that I did like about it and which he was also working on right at the end of his life was the, the issue of the multiverses. Um, so this idea that there could have been countless Big Bangs and each Big Bang gave rise to a different, unique universe with its own constants of electrons, protons, gravity, rate of expansion, etc. Um, and the idea that our cosmos might be one of the rare space times across this multiverse that is actually populated by intelligent beings who can ask about the origins and future of the universe. I think a lot more work has been done and is being done on multiverses. It's sort of it's that point where science moves into philosophy. Um, but I, I just find that whole area fascinating. So do my kids in uh, Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse, which is oh. <laughs> exactly that. It's all these different universes that could simultaneously be happening and how different they all are. And um, yeah, like you said, it's that whole science fiction meets science meets philosophy. It's sort of that gray area where they all kind of intertwine. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and uh, it, on that, Hawking, another quote I got from the book is, there's no more fulfilling way to spend our time on Earth than exploring the limits of the universe by mm. expanding the limits of our minds. Yeah. So it's all about, you know, where physics meets consciousness and what thinking about the universe does for us and what it does to us, you know, as human beings. Um, how, how just even thinking about it, let alone traveling there, um, you know, shapes how, how we see ourselves as humans. That's right. I really liked the quote from the book that says, I'm just a child who has never grown up. I still keep asking these how and why questions, and occasionally I find an answer. 
It's just so <laughs> great that, um, again, that humility that we see from Hawking. And I feel like we can all relate to that of everyone wants to understand how and why, uh, especially when it comes to something as relevant as our planet, our universe that we all live in. So understanding as best as we possibly can how and why it, it all works, uh, it's fascinating. It really is. Yeah. And how did you feel reading the book? Like, um, how, how would you rate as a reading experience, uh, Corinne? Well, so last week I gave highest marks to uh, brief answers to the big questions because I loved the way that book sort of quickly switched from all these re different, really deep and interesting questions. And then we get to hear... Um, Stephen Hawking's perspective on a lot of different topics. So for me, that was perfect. This one, I can't give quite as high marks to only because it felt like a buffet of information about one topic only. And I would have loved mm. to have switched it up a bit. It, you know, it's really focused just on the Big Bang, origin of the universe, black holes, time and space, but it's all sort of one topic. Um, mm. So for me, I'm going to give it three bookmarks out of five. It was interesting and engaging, but it definitely lost me at some points. I can see why it might be a coffee table warmer because uh, you can get so far along and then eventually it's like, oh man, okay, now I don't know what we're talking about anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, as a reading experience, me with my poor scientific background, um, I... I thought it was fascinating, but I did find it hard going at times. I'd, I'd give it only two out of five as a read. Um, but uh, that, that shouldn't stop anyone uh, listening to uh, have a go at it. It's not a long book by any means. Um, and, you know, the science, I think there was an updated version, wasn't there, in 2000 something? Yeah, there's After been a couple of revisions. Yeah, so mm. it came out in 88 and it was revised in 96. And then again, uh, after the year 2000 sometime, they, they so he's had several different updates of, of it, yeah. Yeah. Okay, well, get, get the most recent version and have a read of it or even listen, you know, to the, to the audio book. Um, I can't remember who actually narrated that. Was that him or...? An actor. I, I'm not sure. If it was him. It would make it very interesting. <laughs> right. It might be hard to hard to stick with it. Yeah. Um, but do listen to our full 25, 30 minute book insight on a brief history of time because um, we go into more detail on on the themes and we we lay out the key themes and provide a bit more analysis than uh, than the chat we're having now. So uh, so do make sure you you listen to the full book insight. That's right. And if you want to listen to our entire collection of book insights, go to memo.com slash insights. And there you'll find over a hundred different titles that uh, we have done on a full in-depth exploration of as our, as our book insights. So thanks so much for joining us in the book lounge. Yep. Thanks a lot for listening this week and do make sure you join us next week. Thanks guys. Bye.